Well, game one brought us an alternative ending to Avatar where Jet opened the floodgates and Team Avatar DFM weren't able to stop him. But what can we expect for game number two, guys? Not that reference, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> great stuff. Honestly, he warned us I... he was going to say something. Not that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah honestly, I, I don't necessarily think where DFM need to change that much because aside from the early dive that went a bit wrong the actual early to mid game was pretty good for them they just miss execute a little bit in those late games and i wonder whether maybe some slight shifts in priority might come through but i don't feel they're that far away we'll see what they want to do yeah. though with it i feel like a lot of it is on execution so i don't think they have to go tear up all of their plans either way this is something that we were worried about and something that we saw the start of in game three at the juggernaut match which sengoku lost zero three if honey and jet have agency in a game they're going to do magic and they did that in this game yeah. Uh, the one thing I have to agree with is I, I don't think there was a whole lot of issues with this draft. We saw that DFM came out to like a 6,000 gold lead in the middle of the game, and it had to do yeah. mostly with their rotations, right? It didn't have to do with the draft nearly as much, but as the game went longer and longer, it felt like they, as you guys were saying, it just kind of felt like they assumed that they were going to be winning these team fights later on because, hey, they're DFM. But, you know, it's a Sengoku. You can't just do that against every team. Yeah, it is definitely true. And, and we talked about game time a little bit in the pre-show. It feels like Sengoku kind of embodied the kangaroo stance here. And they took DFM into the deep water. And you don't do that. You don't do that with kangaroos, guys. So I think the, the quicker the game goes, the better for DFM. Keep it shallow. Keep it light. Don't go to that late game. Initialize. <laughs> You, see, you I, mean, I, know, I know that Middlecott's an Udyr main. I didn't know he, we had like a kangaroo stance. Kangaroo now. Is that, is that stance? Doing, or? Stop leaking the rework, J-Real. <laughs> the voice from the heavens comes forth. Is that? But on that note, though, we are going to chug it over to the casters. We'll get Middlecott's, get Middlecott's look on kangaroo stance as well. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. Yeah, kangaroo stance. I'm, I'm okay. all about that. Udyr jumps 400 feet in the air and kicks someone from 3,000 units away. Very, very balanced. Um, But Lexi, right? Yes. It, no one expected us uh, to be here at, at the start of game two with Sengoku with a W in that column. And in CFM now 3-0, I did. Uh, all right, all right. But they have broken... That dank streak, one of the longest streaks in the LJL, 421 days without a win against DFM, no longer, because they were able to pull out that victory in the first game of the series. Let's change that to a zero, Chris. Come on, man. You can't be doing them like that. No, no, no. I think that's fair. It perfectly sums up the point, right? Because that's yeah. just how long, over a year and a half, basically, it took for Sengoku to finally yeah. find a win. Could, I don't, ooh, uh, now I want to really go what about if we go academy teams? I can't remember if DFM oh, well. Academy <laughs> clean sweeps Sengoku or not. DFM Academy well, could win a lot. That was the Sengoku, issue here. I don't think Sengoku Academy won a lot of games. So uh, No, they didn't DFM, either. We got two DF teams that didn't win a lot. D DFM um, may have had the advantage there, but they're not at the advantage um, at they the did moment. Have I really like what the desk was um, talking about there. It mm. felt very disjointed. This big team fight wombo combo comp that DFM wanted to get off wasn't really able to ever secure those ultimates chained into one another. And as these fights were spread apart, it felt like Sengoku's greater focus on skirmishing really paid dividends for them. Oh, there we go. Fantastically done. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that, buddy. Absolute go. Absolute uh, go. So... They had a pretty easy to execute composition, did DFM, and Sengoku kind of understood that. My concern, and something that you brought up uh, as we were covering that last match, was 30 minutes is the typical one. That's the spot that we get to. Yeah, and we'll have to see if Sengoku are able to make the game last as long and pull out the win, or maybe they just want to turn it around and give us something sub 30 minutes, just crush DFM. I don't think oh. that's very likely, but Sengoku fans can always dream. We are back into draft, and it's blue side now for Sengoku and DFM. Going to secure a couple more counter picks on the red. They absolutely are, but something I want to make note, this is a complete run back for the Sengoku adaptation now coming out. That Silas not being banned, so we'll have to see if it is going to come out for Jet. Mm. I'd be very excited. And obviously, in the back of their heads, the Detonation Focus, we're going to have to play around the opportunity or the idea that Silas might get picked in this first rotation. Jarvin locked mm. in, in, as opposed to like the Hecarim, which is we've, we've seen globally has such a high presence rate.
We have, but this is also one of Once's two sort of key picks. The Lee Sin looked great last game. Some amazing defensive play with those kicks to prevent Steel, to prevent Ebi from getting onto the back line, from being able to CC everybody up. The Jarvan, a little bit more aggressive in his playstyle. DFM recognizing that, going for a little bit of safety in the bot lane with the Aphelios Town Kench. Yeah, but um, this is left open Thresh Jinx for the mm. side of Sengoku Gaming. And and Jinx is the main staple champion for Honey. Here it is what he is known for. It is what got access to their third place. That's why it's being hovered here. If it's not locked in, I don't know what will be. Let's get going, Sengoku Gaming 2-0 with a remember <laughs> versus Frasco Jester middle core. The, uh, one of the first wins that Sengoku actually got was when they actually got to play Honey on that one-time Jinx. Immediately afterwards, uh, Rascal just didn't allow it. Jack actually decided to opt in to his mm. Aria, which was fantastic in that last match. As a, well, actually taking it away from Yaharon, supposed to go in that Silas that they left open for him. Yeah, not really the best angle for the Silas, I feel like, at oh. the moment. And really a champion that you kind of need to see the entire draft to understand what you are fighting. But okay. with the Silas now no longer an option steal, it's gonna be on the Nocturne. Well, we saw, we've seen Nocturne definitely ticking up, and I, I actually really like it, especially if we're gonna see Honey on a, ca a champion like Jinx, which is pretty you know, mobile, and they don't actually have any peeling tools already for um, Honey mm. at this moment in time. They've got a bit of a front line, they've got some stuff they can do, but they've not got to protect the president. Tom Kench has already been taken away, obviously, for Harp, unless this is an Ebby Tom Kench. Remember, that's always an angle, but I, I really hope <laughs> it's not gonna be a thing. He is one of the a few top laners who hardcore play time catch but rework time catch probably isn't gonna happen bands coming in it's the nar for sengoku they don't think it's gonna happen top lane i agree with them double support band probably coming out for the fm here though yeah target away from nt who had a pretty decent game one honestly has been uh, one of those players that maybe hasn't been as hyped on sengoku but uh, definitely showing up in these big games where he is needed most i think the nar just sort of to try and prevent a little bit of that pressure being uh, laid down by Ebi because whilst Paz definitely showed up in the late game, he was getting a hell of hurt for the first 15, 20 minutes. Renekton off the board as well. So LGL's two premier top laners not going to be on the docket for this one. That's one way to put them. But we did see, obviously, that Jace coming out from Paz in that last match. Um, DFM, are we going to give counter pick over to um, Ebi? Or do we want to give it to Yaharong? That's the question. I have to imagine they're going to pick a mid laner here and then opt into something else for Ebi to get full information. It's going to be potentially the Twisted Fate. I don't mind it. It does mean we're probably going rapid fire utility Yaharong yeah. as opposed to damage Yaharong. Well, I'm glad that we've not got any Fnatic fans in the call right now because uh, the TF for them yesterday did not look great. Sorry about any spoilers, but uh, really was uh, not the pick. And... It's DFM playing a bit more towards side lanes. The Nocturne, the TF, both champions with these sort of global, semi-global ultimates able to impact lanes very, very easily. And maybe this gives DFM the tools to snowball their advantages a little bit more effectively. So Ngoku responding with a very defensive duo here with the Gragas and the Lulu. Don't mind it. I mean, they, they've brought out the Lulu before. Slight, somewhat kind of protect the president for this jinx, just wild growth. It also doesn't work awfully on um, once either if he gets into the middle. But this Camille was kind of an obvious hover the moment that the Gragas was picked up. And as you mentioned earlier, they're going for split push. I completely agree with you on this. With the global ultimate that TF brings, with also the global of Nocturne, they are looking to just dive onto one to two priority targets. And this is why the side of Detonation, uh, of the side of Sengoku Gaming, had to go for something to protect the president. Because, mm. hey, I mean, if Honey dies, there might not be a lot of damage on Sengoku's side afterwards. Yeah, Ari not really that big carry threat in the mid lane can definitely pop off and chain a fair bit of damage together, but does rely on snowballing a little bit more than some other champions and then more likely going to be going towards this tank build in the top lane for Paz, so Most we're not going to be seeing any bombers, we're not seeing any woody fruity style stuff there. So it really is going to be all on honey and DFM have got a composition that can shut him down.
Yeah, and I, I think the damage profile really from the side of Sengoku Gaming is going to be the most important thing to notice in their itemization, um, because uh, we could see a bunch of off-tanky stuff. Obviously, Gore Drinker is probably going to be coming in for once, but Paz does have some options. Um, yeah. And, and we did see them kind of flex around, kind of not really having a tank in their first match. And I would argue to a degree, because Detonation focused me, that only dedicated tank is going to be Harp, I think... Sengoku maybe might be more incentivized to actually itemize more for damage and just kind of go, hey, if we just kill you all really quickly, because yeah. let's be real, uh, Yudapon, Yaharong, and Steel aren't, aren't going to be tanky at all. No. If they just prevent the engage from DFM, they're probably going to win the long time team fight unless Yudapon gets to pop off on this Aphelios. But Honey's on Jinx, so there's always the Jinx factor, yeah. but there's also the Aphelios factor. I don't know, mate. And, and the, the big thing for me is that Utapon is one of the few Aphelioses that we've seen globally that actually plays it as an aggressive counter into the Jinx. Gale forcing forward when that Gravitum is active to land the Moonlight Vigil, get the route onto multiple people and secure that first bit of the engage for DFM. They're not going to have to do that though because they've got all of these other tools. But if Honey is able to survive, if he is able to continue to pump out the DPS, it could look very, very rough for DFM. We are going to be jumping into game now mm. for the second game of this series. Sengoku with a surprise victory in a round one. DFM looking to bounce back in round two and even up the score. Game on, sir. Game on. Let's have a look at these build let's see if there's anything here i like the spell book on the aharong i think it's really important to be able to rotate around your summoners and really fully utilize the uh the the, the fact that you are playing a twisted fate and you are a utility yeah. champion here you are not a carry think of yaharong as almost like a second support that does a bit of damage um though i'm expecting him to probably go no item build so uh it's going to be the everfrost into the rapid fire cannon just so you have a point and click uh gold card one but. of the great things about TF as a champion is just mm. that Pixie Speed. It's so easy oh, it's to combo so it strong. through. Yeah, and I, I do love the Everfrost Rapid Fire Cannon build because it's one of those things that doesn't feel like it should work. TF is one of these AP mages. Surely you should be building up that ability power, building up a load of the uh, the magic pen as well to deal as much damage as you can. But teams have realized over the past couple of years that that uh, point and click CC is oh so powerful and augmenting that even further with the itemization to get even more crowd control definitely the best way to play the tf and and this is the second time in a row blitzcrank san has actually favored detonation focus me but let's oh. see if like game number one sengoku don't care for what blitzcrank san says and actually wants to do something Ooh. and this is how they can do that once going for a very early invade we saw this in their series versus rascal jester once they had got that first win they felt more confident they felt like they can actually go for these plays and the fact that they're doing this versus dfm is fantastic to see this is adaptation this is improvement from sengoku gaming and i want to see more more. As, as once clears out that grump, he will be dinging over to level 3 very shortly. Wasn't spotted, crucially roaming towards this bot side jungle of steels. That ward in the pixel brush, not going to stop out once as he was able to uh, flag and drag himself over the dragon wall. But now he is going to be running into the Octon, who is very powerful uh -oh. at these early levels. The fear tether is going to come through and connect onto once. The flash may need to be burned here by the Javan, but instead he's just going to go for the blue buff and go, hang on what? still, you're not allowed to be here. DFM caught out in the bot side jungle once again. No kills just yet, but more advantages for Sengoku. Oh, absolutely. I mean, once is probably going to be able to triple buff here because they have prevented Steel's plan of action. And look at this, because of the amount of uh, just how far ahead now once is, Steel basically has to go, uh, I guess I just don't have a bot side of my jungle. And he's going to try and path over to the side of Sengoku's top side. But let's see if pa once is able to get there in time or if actually it's not going to really amount to much. And this is excellent adaptation from Sengoku because Steel really wants to get to that level 6 point on the Nocturne, <laughs> unlock the paranoia, start to be a bit more active on the map. You see now once Pathing Over recognises that the DFM jungler is probably going to be taking a look at this blue buff. And once is responding very, very appropriately here. Gets the Scuttle Crab, once is coming around. I don't know if they got it, both, both junglers have Smite. Yeah, but only one of them has flash, and that is once steel. Yeah. 
Gets the fear off as Jet is actually TP'd into the top lane. They are so invested in shutting down this Nocturne in the early game, and it is paying dividends as it stands. Once with a two-camp advantage isn't massive for a Javan. Not going to be a champion that benefits hugely from the farm, but the Nocturne being shut down is going to benefit Sengoku as we continue into this game. As it stands, though, DFM's lanes are actually doing pretty good. CS advantages for Ebi, Yahrong, and Utapon. Yeah, actually, that's huge. But something I... Oh, my God. They oh, are, I, love, I love the LJL, man. I love the LJL. Look at this part thing because of how it took everything down. Um, what Something I want to highlight and, and a point you made, it's not a huge advantage that once actually got all these camps and Steel is kind of behind. It's the experience difference because you mm. want to have Steel hit six as fast as possible. The fact that he's done kind of a clear and he's still three at five minutes is... um. Kind of a detriment for Detonation Focus Me. That is not what you need. You want it to be dinging your Nocturne 6 as soon as possible. The disruption coming out from once. He's still level 4. Once will probably hit 5 around the same time that Steel is going to hit 4. Which is uh, kind of catastrophic for them. Because guess what? Jarvan Ult is a huge playmaking tool. And honestly, I don't think Once is going to be farming a huge amount of their jungle after they hit 6. Outside of just getting standard experience and everything else oh, that a jungler does. Nah, nah. Once you get that on the Javin, all you do is you throw down the ultimate, you is throw that... down the flag of drag, try and find it. <laughs> this do you know what, Sengoku Gaming? I is agree with you. <laughs> is, is that actually real from them? Of course them? it's real. Of course it's it real. Is. That, is a, that is a banger. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, after playing basically 40 minute games only versus Rascal Jester, I, I, I think there's some something to take from that because they, they went long game versus DFM and then they win. So, um... Damn, their social media manager's on point with that. That is fire. <laughs> I like it. Oh, completely is. Absolutely is. They need um, a raise. They do, always. All social media managers need a raise, especially the one that does the uh, stuff for LGLOU. Oh, yeah. Who is that? that, that that's that's Master One, by the way, for anyone yeah. that like, does a lot of the posting. Well, kind of everyone does. We all the, do. Uh, we all yeah. do, yeah. We it's all team effort. effort. Yeah. yeah, it really is, but... Regarding this series at the moment, not a lot's really happened. After that engage and kind of take away from Steel, um, it's been mostly quiet for the last minute or two. Obviously, you mentioned that TP was used earlier on from Jet. Paz has now just used his into this top side. It's kind of quiet. And I do think this favors Sengoku because um, at the end of the day, you've got a Twisted Fate who doesn't itemize for damage purposes, yeah. and the side of Sengoku does itemize for damage purposes, and, and Jet will actually do damage as opposed to Yaharong, and it's and this is the flip side because Yaharong actually played the utility Ari last game. Um, I would argue Ari offers more output damage-wise, whereas DFM, uh, well, as Twisted Fate just has a point-and-click gold card, as we've already mentioned. Yeah. But the yeah. thing I want to mention now is once is real close to level six, my dude. Look at that experience mm. bar in the top bottom right. Whereas still, he's at least three or four camps behind. Yeah, should be able to hear it at this uh, scuttle crab, actually. So ding. Ta Cataclysm unlocked. Oh, what a great name for an ultimate, by the way. I mean, I'll be honest, a lot of champions in general just have great names for some of their abilities. Um, Ultimate display of perfection or something like that for Kiana's ultimate. I just, Ooh, I, yeah. I, I live for. Supreme display of Supreme talent, talent, I believe. Talent. Oh, it's, oh. A, it's a bit of a banger. Oh, beautiful ultimate. <laughs> I don't know what Tom Kench's ultimate is now. I'll be honest with you. I, I can't remember uh, the name. Munch. Hungry. Not sure if that's the official ability name. Like, uh, uh, I, field, I like yeah. it. I, I like I'm pretty it anyway. sure. I'm pretty sure that's what I read on the LOL wiki. And, uh. Whilst anyone can edit that, no one would lie on the internet, surely. Oh, no one would lie on the internet. You know who would lie, though, with their level 6 now hitting? It is Steel. He's got the Nocturne ultimate. And while Sengoku fended this off for definitely two minutes longer than it should have been, mm. they've not done anything with the extra time they brought themselves. So DFM can still very much make up for lost time. And Rift Herald is here. Dragon is here. And Sengoku haven't taken anything. They haven't even started any of these things. So uh, DFM still have an opening to have an early game advantage. We're not at 14 minutes yet. Yeah. And those early objectives really weren't prioritized too much by either team in the previous game. Oh. And I think maybe that contributed to the game going a little bit longer than DFM would have liked. And obviously Sengoku 
pulled out those team fights in the later stages and i'm starting to see a couple of parallels actually from uh, game one because whilst honey was a massive carry in that one once again he's behind in cs versus utapon and harp i mean it's the abby diff my dude uh this is why he solo killed visit charge yes i'm bringing that up once again because we always love to do that but now we, we we've seen multiple members of dfm step up over and over again obviously the aria over in lck technically weird we won't talk about that too much but solo killing faker like we have had yeah. players do pretty huge things on the side of dfm steel obviously has the most famous na clip of all time oh, now no. the crabber like 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 can we get like the lgl has given the world so much and we're yes. gonna give you even more when we come to worlds and msi once again which one of these teams will get to do and at the moment it might be Sengoku Gaming. It might be. It might be. For the first time in their history. Yes. Really would be an upset, but they've got a couple more games that they are going to need to win before that becomes a reality. Harold's been on the table for a couple minutes. Both teams now starting to rotate towards it. As actually Honey is sent back down to the bot lane. So prioritizing a little bit this solo XP, solo farm, solo plate gold for your Jinx. Whereas DFM think that the objective is the best way to go. Oh, uh, they have a 100% first Herald rate versus Sengoku currently in playoffs, so I'm liking this angle. I love the fact that DFM are also going to just use the Twisted Fate Ultimate to, one, see where all the members of Sengoku are. They noticed where NT was and then immediately were like, okay, that's fine. Yaharong, you rotate round bot, you collect that wave. Let's just have everybody do everything. Uh, Paz, buddy, might have a bad time here. Uh, ults are all up for DFM. Ults up for Paz, though. Flash is available as well. In goes the Ooh. Abyssal Dive, and there is nowhere for the Gragas to go. First blood for Steel. I love that that Paz at the end of that. Really wanted oh, to no. make sure that all DFM was oh, oh, safe. No, 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 no. No way, no way, no way. I mean, that was a tickle. It was a tickle. It was a tickle. Tom Kane, it is, it was it's a tickle. an execute. It's an execute. Okay, so it looks really stupid when, like, this big, super <laughs> mega death rocket, and it hits someone for about, like, 100 HP. You're like, great. Um, but Herald Summit in the top lane. More plate gold for Ebby and Steel and yep. Likers Jet. Might be looking for a bit of a fight here. But with that uh, extended pressure offered in the top side, Sengoku taking full advantage, getting four plates onto Honey and NT as well. So, do you have oh, some of that's just onto Honey? Mm. That's, some of those plates have just gone onto Honey. And that's um, the worst player for DFM to give. Because who's the man that. Basically 1v9 DFM back in summer split on Axis. Yes. It was Honey on this Jinx. This is why we amped up this champion for Honey, because it's brokenly good. But yeah, but Jet also finding this onto Ebi. Just Sengoku look like a different beast after that series versus Rascal Jester now. I this really... is not the same one from the Juggernaut match, oh, middle not at all. Not at all. This is a completely different team. Mythic's completed for both AD carries here. Utapon opting towards that Gale Force, giving him a bit of flexibility. But Honey, doubling down on the damage versus a full dive composition. This is a player that really backs his own skill in pretty much any matchup. But he's going to have to use every last ounce of that League of Legends ability. If he's going to stay alive, if he's going to output the damage that he needs to in this game it has been a slow one still only sat at that single kill for steel at the 13 minute mark and more time for jinx is bad for dfm but i would argue that the time for camille may be even worse for sengoku I, it's it's gonna be an interesting one i'll be i am very intrigued to see how this goes obviously remember though neither team has actually taken first <laughs> turret yet though there are turrets pretty low at this moment i have to imagine ebby is um rather keen to use that rift herald that steel did use top lane earlier on when they killed paz to actually kind of make sure that advantage stays with them as um a lot of gold as we mentioned has been injected into honey they have even put that cull like honey is so much like they'll just throw everything in the honey train and mm. then figure out how can we play around them later as this game goes on one thing we did bring up on the desk, and I want to just bring it back to that, is we are seeing Paz going for that full tank build. So it is going to be Giga Tank Chad Paz going mm. for this, and then the rest of the side of Sengoku kind of playing around the engage that they have. They've got once on this J4. They've got Ari, so Jet, we know, lands 
just everything and anything. We saw that in the last series on the LeBlanc. Landing a charm is like child's play for Jet. So <laughs> I am very excited to see the first 5v5 as we're already seeing Paz rotate around and they're going to fight for this second dragon. I imagine they are. Why else would they all be rotating around? I'm just imagining the timer, mate. That's what I'm going with here. As, uh, not quite on the rift just yet. Nope. Just uh, trying to secure Honey Why and Empty a bit more in this spot side. And Paz, okay. after leaving top lane, uh, yeah. has left that one to Ebby. Maybe would have gone down on that wave anyway. Um, Probably. Reset coming through for the Gragas, picking up that Frostfire Gauntlet to uh, get a bit more of that defensive power. And you can really see where these teams have prioritized resources in this early game. Four plates taken in favor of Ebby. For those for Sengoku going towards Honey and NT. So, as we hit a little bit of a lull state now, at the 15 minute mark, this is where we take our snapshot of the game. Then they should focus me. 1k gold up in the lead, and they've got a very even, even dis distribution. Distribution, Jesus. Words failing me a little bit. Um, on their players, whereas the side of Sengoku, as we've already mentioned, Honey's got a lot of their gold, and he's already starting out by beginning this, and they're going on to him. Destiny, Gate, Paranoia, dead. Honey, nowhere to go. Couldn't cleanse, couldn't flash, taken out. Ebby, now looking for the plate onto Jet. Jet no. He's trying to spirit rush away, and will just escape. Slither's HP. As the final shot is not enough. DFM find a single kill. Still flashes over the wall. Securing the second with the Dustbringer. And now Paz and Once will be running away with the tails between their legs. DFM not going for anything more. But this early game may be a bit better for them this time around. As Paz overextended in mid. And could just body slam himself out. And this is going to be a Rift Herald probably for Detonation Focus Me. They might even look to do some more with this as Udipon is just collecting all of the farm, all of the CS going to prevent as much from going on to Honey. And this is something we talked about when we first saw this comp be fully locked in for DFM. Mm. If they want to, they can kill any target over and over and over again because they have a Nocturne. They have a Twisted Fate. That's kind of what the champions are. That's why I said NT is going to just have to live and die by Honey. They're split here. So there was nothing they could do. And all of the members of Sengoku were actually rather split. I mean, thankfully, Jet was able to get away holding the Ari Dash. I actually didn't even use it. I had to use his Flash. Udipon's ultimate just not doing the right amount of damage. It probably wouldn't have mattered, but still still able to clean up on that. And where... What could have Sengoku done really differently outside of grouped better as a team? Mm. Because there wasn't really many other options for them in that fight. And, and this is what the Destiny Paranoia combo can do. It can cause disarray in your team. It can cause you to split up. And in those sort of fractions of seconds when the Nocturne is flying in, when the TF is porting down as well, you've got to decide very quickly, okay, how are we playing out this fight? Are we engaging onto the TF? Are we trying to peel for the Nocturne? Are we trying to get Honey away? How are we resetting this? It's a difficult question since Sengoku didn't have an answer. They will be able to take this Herald though. Maybe want to chuck this down in mid, take down that tower and be able to push the vision line a little bit further. It took them around about 30, 35 minutes to take out DFM's mid tower in the previous game. This time around, it looks like it might be a little bit quicker, but Utapon using that ultimate to try and deny the push. Yeah, there's, this is going to be important for the side of Sengoku to still try and find some mutual objectives, still to fight around some of these fights. The issue they're going to find is uh, it's been just a little bit too long now for them. So DFM actually have all their ultimates back up now. So they can just go straight back to what they were doing. I love this. Destiny Gate thrown really early out. Let's just see where all the members are. Okay, that's where they are. We can take this dragon with no problems. Yaharong, you can push this top lane. And then we'll just back out. We'll just reset. We'll just... Do it again, and DFM looking to play around dragons. Not something they've done a lot this split, but I'm liking the angle they're taking. And hey, if it ain't broke, why change it? Why change it? And uh, it's not going to be a cloud soul this time around. Hex tech gates on the rift. So opting towards that soul win condition is even more pertinent. Paranoia pop by steel there. It's actually a very big cooldown. Baited out by Sengoku there means that not going to be able to find too many more proactive plays in the next couple of minutes. Yaharong coming back towards this top side, running forward with the gold card, looking to get a bit of damage down onto Jet, just harassing the Ari, making it a bit longer for him to get back to base. I want to see 
some way of Sengoku figuring out how to play around Honey. Because I, I do feel like they will kind of live and die if Honey is enabled in a team fight or not. But yeah. obviously, Detonation Focus to me's whole objective is to just not allow him to play this team fight. <laughs> it's why we're seeing, um, obviously, I have to imagine the side of Sengoku going, okay, um, if that's how they play this whole game, we don't win. Because they will just kill us. And Camille is... Ebi will become an issue for us. And even if we do kill, like, a Yaharong, who cares? Even if they kill Steel, who cares if you already got to do the Paranoia and kill Honey? Because it's like, then they have Utapon coming in afterwards. It's this kind of double carry composition coming yeah. out from the side of DFM with just burst damage with Steel. And then you've got the side of Sengoku where they're like, they've got a lot of options and angles. But uh, if they don't get to play the team fights how they want to play it, it could all be for naught. Yeah. I think one of the ways that Sengoku really got a lot of their advantages in that previous game that they were able to get the win in mm. is by punishing DFM's overextensions, over ingressions, engages that aren't quite as coordinated as you'd like them to be. But this yeah. time around, DFM, their composition feels a bit more reliable in terms of finding that engage. And that means that Sengoku the significant difficulties in playing out a lot of these fights both teams stancing up in the mid lane towers around about half hp for both sides as jet is roaming down paranoia destiny gate are both available so dfm can respond to or make a play if they need to still going to be spotted out on this ward but chooses not to clear it as he backs away all right, so Shirelia's just came in not too long ago for NT. I have to imagine we're going to be seeing a Mercurial's Blessing just for all of the protect honey sort of idea. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm, I really just want to see what they can do. DFM just eating their jungle, and I love this. DFM playing proactively. We saw them play a bit too, ref uh, with a lot of respect over for the site. Oh, oh that's awkward. Uh, we'll, we'll just pretend <laughs> that didn't happen. Um, we saw them playing with a lot of respect in that first game, and it kind of came back to haunt them a little bit. Whereas I would argue now, they're playing with a bit more confidence, it feels yeah. like. They're actually challenging Sengoku a bit more, really making them always hand check, and they're noticing mm. they can get away with it a bit more. It's a bit, it's sort of an, an irresistible arrogance. Yeah. I, I feel like it is, is the best way to watch DFM. It's when they are supremely <laughs> confident in what they're doing and what their composition wants to do, and they're just like, yo, we can out execute you every single time. Couple drakes in their back pockets. This Hextech spawning in a minute and a half would be the third, put them towards that sole point. And Sengoku are going to be the team that needs to start finding these engages because whilst they were able to win out in the late game in game one, I don't think you can do that versus a Hextech cell. I mean, no, oh, you can't do that. And if anything, what I want to emphasize is the fact that Hextech Soul is really good for the side of DFM. Look at who they've got. Attack speed, attack speed, attack speed, attack speed, Tom Kench. Okay, so even Tom Kench doesn't hate the attack speed, remember, because the cheese builds in ARAMs and, and random game modes, that, like all for one is sometimes just playing attack speed crit Tom Kench because of your tongue lash. So is that the world we're living in? No, we're not, thankfully, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but I just want, I'm trying to emphasize the point that Hextech Soul, probably the best soul outside of maybe Infernal Rift for maybe DFM. Infernal. It's it's a difficult one as uh, Sengoku, it's clear that they understand that they need to get this Drake. That's why they are prioritizing this mid lane shove yeah. so much so they can get a bit more pressure around there, push some vision a little bit further. Now the question for DFM is, do they want to engage into Sengoku when they've got a bit more of this positional advantage? Or are they going to go, yo, it's just a single Drake. We'll give it up. We'll get something else on the map and fight for them a little bit later. Well, it looks like actually DFM, Eddie included, they just want to fight around Bar Baron at 23 minutes. Okay, okay DFM. Um, if that's the trade we want to make, uh, we have to make sure Sengoku actually opt into this. Because if they don't, and they do exactly what they're planning to do here... Yeah. Uh, it's kind of free. Destiny should be popped at some point soon because it looks like Sengoku are just going to take this for free. Uh, once potentially caught out here, though, as uh, Giant's Growth is used. Wild Growth, excuse me. Paranoia onto the RE. But Jet can dash himself away once again. TFM burning engage tools and not finding anything for it. Yarong not to wave from the fight, though. And now Paz is isolated in the front line. Body slams away to buy some more time. But he will get chased down that thimble into that shield, not meaning too much as Honey. Also, take oh, a look at the flash! Tongue lash! Harp with the kill. 
What a performance. DFM, I'm still not quite sure that really worked out how it, how it should have for you. And, and, and quite frankly, that was horrible. But it worked. You did give them the dragon. And the fact that Sengoku got the dragon and then got to come back afterwards, uh, yeah. not great. Really not great. But uh, DFM found the angles. They found the objective with this Baron. They get the kills. And... Uh, well, let's come into this replay and try and break this down because it all starts with them finding a pick onto once. The moment that they do this, though, their dragon also goes down. Paranoia pops, but they can't find any more kills. And honestly, from Sengoku, this is where it should end. They should just group up. Issue is, Paz is a bit too far ahead. Jet though, tries to do a lot, but misses everything. And you can definitely see a world where if Sengoku hit a lot of this stuff all in once, uh, it probably goes from bad to worse for DFM. It doesn't, they miss a lot of their stuff. And this tongue lash at the end is just kind of the cherry on the top to just go, Sengoku, you're now out of this game. The gold lead is now like 6K. They've got the Baron, they've got the dragons. DFM are well and truly in the driver's seat when it comes to objectives. And it's what we wanted to see. DFM got leads in game one, but they didn't snowball them effectively. This is looking pretty damn effective. Whilst we were in that replay, Jet was taken out by Ebby in a solo kill, and the 4v5 is going to be so nice for the number one seed. Steel flashing forward to secure the kill. TP's coming through, though. Sengoku are responding to this uh, one, but it might not be enough. Harp taken out, traded for once, but it's three dead on the side of Sengoku. Three alive for DFM still. A minute and a half left on this Baron. How much more can they take? Yeah, Unipod is just going to keep doing this. Guys, you can't stay here. They've got Rapid Fire Cannon also on Yaharon with a Lich Bane. I was saying this is not going to be a damaging... I mean, with a Lich Bane, you're going to keep doing it. And look at this. This is just oh. pain. Once again, Jet escapes on very, very low HP from, uh, <laughs> from that gin. But... Uh... This game is not looking good for Sengoku. We saw the account tweet, yo, late game is ours. But DFM, they don't seem concerned with going to late game. It is all action all the time as we're jumping into this solo kill replay. Oh, Abby, how clean is this going to be? All right, one, two, I have to imagine. Yeah, straight in. Jed doesn't have the ultimate here, remember? So it's pretty cookie cutter for them here well done ebby at least finding that but then it's because they find this it's what it ends up turning into everything else because because they don't have yaharong and this baron they just feel like they can keep pushing forever this paranoia and immediately going on to them but then ending up just killing enti beforehand whether that was intentional or not i actually love it because the wild growth didn't get to go off couldn't be used couldn't be used mate Enti couldn't buy any time for his team, and we are seeing Sengoku reaping what they sue in Sowed. In the Sue? So? Sue? So? So? So. so. Yeah. They are reaping what they have sown in the draft phase because we highlighted that it's not a lot of safety for Honey. It's a very, very risky position that he's been placed in. And when you're 03 2, when this Jinx should be at her strongest point, approaching three items, it's not going well for you. No, nope, but with a 4.8 cap Baron power play, I almost did the accidental call out there, but we're not sponsored by anyone, so we don't have to make that call out. <laughs> uh, God, they have really, truly done exactly what their marketing team wanted to do. Did that uh, Did that sponsor it's of another worked. league? It's worked, it's uh, worked. But I, I don't have to say that, so I'm going to just keep saying it like this, because DFM, um, I've used the term ceaseless aggression, but 27 minutes with a 10k gold lead, um, I think that's it, but uh, Epi, you're a Pretty far up, buddy, on your own. Absolutely fine, though. We'll use that Hextech Ultimatum and flash away. No, Ebby. It's just too good at League of Legends, man. And this means that Yaharong can keep pushing in the top lane. And Utapon, Harp, and Steel can rotate to this open oh. inhib. So Goku, they're panicking. They don't know what to do. There's not a right play for them at the moment. And... It was such a protracted game one. It's such a protracted series against Rascal Jester. We asked whether they've got the stamina to see this series out and DFM potentially answering with an emphatic no. Well, it's only the second game. They got the first one, but I completely agree with you, Middlecott. These 
These two teams are definitely jostling for position here. DFM are probably going to close this game out rather effectively and cleanly. We already saw how their rotation worked. Uh, Evi getting that all, like, four to five members to pull to just try and get them. But because of that, Yaharon was able to make the cross-map play. Um, Paranoia used defensively just to save Ebi because if you can't see Ebi... How can you get him? I, I just so much mental game stuff going on. I love this from DFM. Uh, what does this mean though? Mm. Middle call. For draft adaptation now. Because DFM have shown another composition, another play style that they can pull out of their back pocket that we hadn't seen from them before. This is a unique play style. Um, so now. How are Sengoku going to react to this? Because they had some must bans every single time, remember? That karma has never been allowed. Trindamir, the flex pick between mid and top. There's so much from them. Oh, and by the way, Caitlyn, Yudapon just isn't allowed to play that champion, by the way. Oh, it's absolutely disgusting. Um, yeah, it is. And we are getting to the point where the number of target bans that you need to throw in draft are probably sort of six, seven, eight. And fun fact, you don't get that many bans. So something Yet. has to go through. I will fight Maybe for it one day, mate. <laughs> Hey, hey, when League of Legends has 200 champions on the roster, I think that's when it's happening. We're not far off that, actually. We are pretty close, and we've also got 200 years of game design on Utapon with this Aphelios. Three yep. items completed. Gale Force, Infinity Edge, and the Bloodthirster for a little bit more sustain. There was a lot of damage coming out of the bot lane for DFM, a lot of damage coming out of the top lane. And Sengoku feels like this is their last opportunity to find something down so much, but DFM are split. Ebi is split pushing. They need to go now, but that Moonlight Vigil is going to do a hell of a lot to dissuade the aggression. Paranoia thrown out, but it's still Utopon being played onto. Eaten up, cast away, but it's still in the backline. TP is going to come through from Ebi. Already a single kill picked up for DFM, and it is the AD carry. It is the most important member of Sengoku, and Not that means wrong. that the rest of this fight is torn apart for Sengoku. Torn asunder, fail, flash, and it's Yaharong finding the kills. It's DFM finding the plays, and it's DFM evening up the series. What a performance from Detonation Focus Me. A very strong answer back towards game number one, but they're going to get this Nexus. Not quite Sub 30 minutes, but a hell of a lot quicker than game one. One apiece now, DFM versus Sengoku. Well, are we going to get the full five? Will we get silver scrapes? Well, we won't know for a while, but DFM responded rather effectively, and I am so excited to see what we're going to see after this middle cop, because this has now raised some questions, because we've seen both these sides win. Um, And uh, may I just add, Honey lost on Jinx. The last time that happened in playoffs, that was versus Detonation Focus Me as well. Uh, worrying trend, may I just say. Worrying trend potentially, but obviously only two games down. And DFM looked pissed after that game one. They came through fighting. They really took it to Sengoku. And you know what, Lexi? I mm. wouldn't be surprised if we see similar stuff for Sengoku yep. in the next game. But we're going to be jumping to a short break before the analyst desk is going to break down what we've just witnessed.
Well, this is kind of what we expected. Game one, Sengoku came through with a ray of sunshine. But DFM said, you think darkness is your ally? With a bit of a bane <laughs> momentum. Come through with the nocturne and just shred paranoia. It was kind of what we expected. Initialize, how are you feeling after game two? No one cared who I was till I pressed the R key. I don't care what I, 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 so full of disclosure, I <sighs> bought him this stream deck. That was a birthday present to him many years ago. And it was a mistake, guys. I am so sorry. It's my fault. What was not a mistake, though, was DFM's play in this game. They actually did decide to change up the style of draft. It was less about the, the flanking teleports. It was a little less about the, the run over the Zaya. It was much more about let's 1-3-1. One, one. We have a Camille. We have a TF. We have a, a Nocturne. We jump on a target. We blow them up. And they played it out actually exceptionally well. They are probably the only team, I feel, that consistently play 1-3-1 well in the LGL. You saw it in this game. They got very significant gold leads. And then they managed to snowball it from that. Much improved. I like the change in draft. And the fresh looked looked good against Sengoku. You know, definitely did. And, and we can look at some of the early game. Obviously, there was that slight question mark where once were they able to get the invade. But this bot lane play... Yeah. Is where it all started. So I'm not going to lie. I don't like reducing games down to singular moments. But if there was to want to do it, this is a pretty good example of it. Because what DFM do in this play is they just play out their comp the way they want to. Paz isn't at the play. You put on down, put down the paranoia. They split the fight. They use their access mobility to get onto the targets. And because you've got Camille ult, you don't even get to fight against that mobility that well. The big thing for me here isn't actually that uh, DFM get the kills, because that is nice. What the real big thing after this is that they end up getting bot turret, opening up the map. At the same time, Paz isn't defending that top side. DFM get priority of the entire map in terms of lane shove. They're shoving in on all lanes. And that basically doesn't change from the rest of the game after that point. This was, it's not even like a straw that breaks the camel's back since that early on. It's just a hammer blow to your spine. Yeah, and I feel like there. we showcase some of the really that, big parts. Of uh, of what DFM do really well across the entire season is they have incredible trigger pull. Whenever they see a play, they're willing to go for it. And you could tell that Sengoku were trying to set up. They were trying to see if they could stop the dive from coming down. You already saw Jet on his way once was already down in the bottom half of the map. But DFM was like, oh, you guys are a little bit too far separated and we're going to go now. And that's the kind of thing that a lot of teams can't really deal with. And we'll see how well it splits up Sengoku in some of the rest of our clips. And, and I Before think what this I... ends up doing is uh, just one more thing is that just Phil Philosophically, this works very well against SG because if they have the front to back, we see how well they play it out. This is not their specialty. DFM draft is something which didn't allow Sengoku to play towards their real strength. Yeah, before I managed to jump down Joshi's throat there. Sorry about that, mate. I was just see a little thing that made me quite excited in that little clip as well was obviously if you check that one out, the paranoia meant that Enti could not see Honey across the wall, so we couldn't wild growth them as well. So just little things that didn't go their way that did in the first game towards the late game as well, where, you know, you did get the kick to prevent the Megana into the wall by those little seconds. This time, the clutch factor was on DFM side, alongside some like nice little interactions between those abilities. And that was a fun little addition to that clip. Yeah, and then it didn't stop there. You know, we talked about how they've got a comp that likes to pick. They have the Twisted Fate. They have the Nocturne. They just find the openings that they need. Yeah. Do you, and uh, um, oh, go, go on, go, Josh. You, you can take oh. this one. <laughs> See, I was going to say, I feel like we end up seeing a lot of opportunities for DFM to just play with a lot of information, right? You know, we were looking at how they were splitting up the other team uh, earlier by getting all this paranoia by separating them out. But here, we just kind of see uh, Sengoku do it to themselves. And a big part of this just comes down to the fact that DFM it feels like they've woken up after the first game. They've started recognizing where they need to be at the same time. You're seeing that Evie and Steel are a little bit more coordinated, but even more than that, Yaharong is also coming in at the same time. And the communication that was kind of absent in some of their engages before, that problem is no longer here. And, and kind yeah. of hammering down on the information point too, I think, uh, you know, there will be some comments a little bit about how Yaharong's first couple of ultimates maybe didn't do as much. One was saving plates on the bot side and, and all this other stuff. But the fact that you have so many R buttons to press go and you can use the TF ult to, again, give you the information to make the plays um, in a safe manner too. You don't always have to pull the trigger on it. It's actually very, uh, it's, um, it's one of the hallmarks of DFM of this iteration where they don't always over aggress, where... Last year, and actually some of their worst games in this one too, occasionally they'll say, ah, we'll, we'll just go for it anyway. Not yeah. so much for this kind of composition. And this is good evolution from DFM, in, in, at least in today's game. Big one as well. Yeah, and, yes. and there was some fight back as well from Sengoku as well. They tried yeah, to turn yeah. it around, but, but as we see, once again, DFM just too clean. And obviously DFM have had a lot better map control this game. The ward control was significantly better, all of this stuff. And then basically after that play, they got the Barret, right? 
and you get this situation where they know Steel is there, it doesn't matter a jack but thing. I can't say that word on air, but either way, the point is, <laughs> you get on the bot lane and they disappear, right? And you get a couple back, that's great, but all you're killing is the jungler who's burned everything and killed your bot lane, great, and you've killed the Tom Kench, who is not that important, and then Unipon gets to do horrible things to people, and you can still split push, you've still got Baron, and with the gold card lich, but you can't even walk up to threaten that mid lane, so and I think just the to shove kind of... on the pressure point was so good with this Baron to get even more gold out of it. I think it just kind of speaks to the desperation, the way that um, Sangoku are playing as well, and just to speed things up as well, obviously the game ends fairly soon after that, with one last clip that we have left to run, and I think what we saw is that Sangoku were like, well, we cannot play on the front, uh, like on the, on the back foot too often, this really isn't working for us, how are we going to start peeling back? And they do try and split the uh, split the fight and try and get towards Utapon in this very last one, but again, they don't have the mobility advantage, and it kind of falls apart from that. And what we're also seeing here is, once again, they're isolating this Lulu so effectively, right? We were looking at the Jinx-Lulu combo at the beginning of the draft as something that could be a real power point if Sengoku can defend it. But every single time we take a look at one of these clips, Yaharang is either gold carding them or they're separating NT from the rest of the fight. So all the buffs that the Lulu provides to the to the Jinx just aren't available. And that one, even though the wild growth yeah. goes off, is on somebody else. And then Honey just gets caught in the bush and dies before the shield can come back up. Shout out to well, the Lich Bane pick up third. Really smart. Yeah, it's, it's all smart play, but I will say DFM, they didn't pick the Nardis game, but it does feel like they've thawed out and they are ready to wake up. The heat is rising. We'll have to see how it goes in game three. But we're going to go to a short break before all of that.